continue in our sermon series today. Um, we're going to be picking up the conversation in Revelation, if I can get my thoughts together here, <laughs> Revelation chapter um, 13, I believe. And I ask you to read 13 through 16, but we're not going to get through, um, you know, I'm not going to teach through all those, but they're kind of in the same section here. So I'll come back to those in, in just a minute. I'm going to read a couple verses that I'll give you. But the last time we gathered last week, we talked about Revelation 12. We talked about this infamous woman and dragon scene, and we uncovered how Satan is absolutely angry because he wants to be like God, but he can't, right? That's why he's angry. He wants to be like God, but he can't. He's upset, and he has literally built his entire demonic ecosystem centered around his one mission that we talked about, to kill, to steal, and destroy. And last week, we looked at this verse. Um, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, and let me see if I can pull it up here. Um, but well, if you have your Bibles, you can just look at it there. It says, then the dragon was enraged at the woman, and he went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus, right? And so what the book of Revelation should be doing within us at this point in the series is stirring up within us that whether you believe it or not, we are in an all-out war. We're in a war. And this war, we, but at the moment we confess our faith in Jesus, we have been enlisted into this war, right? And, and the enemy, he hates to see people unified in Christ. He hates to see it. He, he will give all of his being to destroy and crush us in our attempt to pursue and obey Jesus. That's why following Jesus is hard. It's because we have an adversary whose whole entire existence and meaning is to make sure, is to try his absolute best to keep us from following Jesus. And the unfortunate reality, and the reason why we have so many people who walk away from Christ and walk away from his church, is because for some reason we've been telling people that if you give your life to Jesus, if you just sow this seed of faith, if you stand in this prayer line, if you get plugged in and connected, if you dance hard enough and shout hallelujah loud enough, you can walk with God in this life problem free. We, we've been telling people if you come to Jesus, he'll fix your relationship. If you come to Jesus, he will cancel all of your debt. All of it, student loans and everything. If you come to Jesus, he'll cancel it. And this is why so many people are attracted to the prosperity gospel because it tells them all the things that they want to hear but when real life happens to them they walk away from God because they came to him not because of his mercy and grace alone not because of his love and his sacrifice not because of the cross but simply because they wanted to finesse God for a blessing walking with Jesus is not a guarantee that you won't go through problems can somebody say amen it's not a guarantee that you won't have issues in your marriage. Amen. It's not a guarantee that, that you won't experience heartbreak or have issues with your children, but it is a promise that you will walk through this life not by yourself. That you will face every issue with God, not just by your side, but inside of you. When we talk about discipleship, when we talk about sanctification, we are talking about you and I, Growing in obedience. That's what we're talking about. It's growing in our loyalty to Jesus. We should all strive to be more loyal to Jesus today than we were at this point last year. Amen? Amen. This point last week, yesterday, we should all strive to be more loyal in our obedience to Jesus. Right? But Revelation 13 is going to show us why it's so hard to remain loyal to Jesus. Okay? And so what I want to do in chapter 13, I'm just going to read verses 1 and 2, and then verse 11 through 14. And then I'm going to also talk about through chapter 14 a little bit. But let's do this. It says, The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. I should have gave you all a warning before I read this. <laughs> the beast I saw resembled a leopard but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power 
and his throne and great authority. Let's look down to verse 11. Then I saw a second beast, my goodness, coming out of the earth this time. Not the water, but the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all of the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs. Look at that. Even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of all the people. Last verse here, verse 14. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform. Ain't that something? Power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth and it ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. Father, this is your word, so help me to teach it in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we approach Revelation chapter 13, we see that this dragon, which we have clearly uh, made plain that this is Satan, right? We see that he's not at work by himself, all right? He enlists, in what we just read about, he enlists a beast that comes out of the sea, metaphorically, and the beast that comes out of the earth. And here we see once again how Satan, he tries his best to imitate God. He tries his best because think about this. God is triune. When we talk about the triunity of God, the Godhead that's made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But this wicked counterfeit triunity is made up of the dragon, the beast of the sea, and the beast of the earth. And the reason why wickedness can so easily deceive us is because it presents itself in images and languages of divinity. And that's why our culture is constantly winking at wickedness, right? That's why we are so easily deceived by the spirituality of other religions. And that's why it's so easy for other people to convince Christians that all religions are the same. All paths lead to the same place. And I just want to remind you today, just because something looks spiritual does not mean that it's godly. Somebody say amen. Amen. Just because it looks spiritual does not mean that it's godly. But it's because of this counterfeit triunity of the dragon of these beasts that we see in our own lives, in our world today, that everybody who says God ain't talking about Jesus. The enemy disguises himself, this is what your Bible says, as an angel of light. So, of course, there's going to be similarities between religions and Christianity. Even Muslims pray to God. They call him Allah, but they pray to God. They have Jesus mentioned in their book, the Quran. Even atheists believe that Jesus existed at one point in history. Even Catholics believe in Jesus. Many major religions have some reference point of Jesus. But the right view of Jesus is what makes the difference. The enemy has done a great job of building these religions, these movements, and presenting them to us as the light or another light that's just like the one we in. And he works so hard behind the scenes to deceive. And there's no difference here in chapter 13 with these two beasts. Throughout the Old Testament, if you go back and read these later, Job 40 and 41, you definitely got to read Daniel chapter 7. You're going to see prophetic literature where animals were used to describe some kind of political power and authority at that time, right? Daniel 7, he says he saw four beasts, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a beast that was indescribable, similar to what we just read about in Revelation 13. And in that dream, God reveals to him that these animals represented wicked kingdoms that was in authority at that time. You see, the beast of the sea is the state. It is the kingdoms of this world. It is the governing authorities of this world that have ejected God from the center. So the dragon, he goes after the people of God, but in this case, not directly. He goes after them through manipulated political powers. And here's the thing. Political parties do not set out to become a monster as described here in our text. For the most part, nobody you know sets out to be savagely wicked. But anytime you set out to be your own master, anytime you set out to be your own Lord, you will inherently become wicked. 
It's not like people wake up. It's not like you and I wake up and say, decide, we're going to pursue wickedness today. But anytime you set out to be Lord over your own life, it's just a matter of time before you turn to wickedness. And this nation, our government, although continuously, for some reason, claiming to be a country built upon Christian principles, have set out long ago to be its own God. And this text tells us in verse 2 that Satan, he gives authority to this beast. In verse 6, we see that this dragon, he empowers this, this government to blaspheme God and to slander his name. And no matter what wing you may fall under, Republican, Democrat, anything in between, the government that you follow may be right to a point, but then it follows the beast. That has been historically true for every political power and is true regarding our governments today. And I'm going to give you an example just the other day. You may not like this, but just the other day I was reading about laws that are trying to be passed now. In some states, they've already been passed, where children who have a desire to become the opposite sex, the opposite gender, but do not have their parents' consent to have gender-altering surgery, these kids can be taken away from their homes, taken away from their families, taken away from their parents if they tell their kids no. And if you don't believe me, text me. I'll send you the article. All right? In most states, you've got to be 18, year old, 18 years old just to get a tattoo. But somehow our governments believe that a 10-year-old is emotionally mature and mentally stable enough to make a non-reversible decision regarding their bodies and their gender. And we chalk this up to it just being the times. We chalk it up to just being progressive, but the truth of the matter is that this is the impact of this beast in Revelation chapter 13, who legislates, not just legislate, but then also financially underwrites all manner of wickedness, all in the name of democracy. John is trying to show us this sobering truth that governments that step out from under the rule of God, they do not become more divine like they ignorantly assume. Instead, they become more demonic. Governments that exalt humanity as the measure of all things do not become more humane. They become more depraved. And the enemy knows that if he can get our governments to approve, to legislate, to finance wickedness, now comes the pressure on the saints, on the believers to compromise. And if you don't compromise, if you don't agree with their agenda, you're marked as a bigot, you're marked as intolerant and hateful, and you get called everything, I'm telling you, every name in the book except the child of God. So how do we stand against such pressure? We stand against this pressure by realizing, as John had wrote in Revelation chapter 13, that your names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. The text calls us to not to hold allegiance to political parties, but to hold allegiance, if any, very lightly to political parties. Allegiance to the state is always secondary to the allegiance to the kingdom of God. Amen? John tells in chapter 13, verse 11, that this next beast, it had horns like a lamb. Now, we know throughout the scripture, lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world represents Jesus. So now comes this Rinky-dink lamb, can't think of another word. This lamb, he comes imitating Jesus, and he had horns like a lamb. But the text says, spoke like a dragon. Mm. Imagine a lion talking like a dragon. I mean, a lamb talking like a dragon. Verse 13 says, the beast even performed great signs. You know, the signs that we love lining up outside of buildings for great wonders that we love paying tickets to see. And if you read this section slowly and carefully, you would pick up on all the religious overtones. You see words like great signs, worship, words like fire coming down from heaven. A lot of this religious jargon and verbiage is because this beast represents the danger of dragon-manipulated religion. You see, we just talked about political power and how that can become the enemy of discipleship, but so can false religion. 
there are a lot of people around the world and in the ministry who've got authority, right? They have the ability to perform signs and wonders and miracles, and they are preaching at conferences and revivals, but just because they have a platform, it doesn't mean that they are pointing people to the authentic Jesus. And many times, because we are so uh, drunk on a person's gift, that we become too blinded to discern their message. The Bible says because of the signs of this beast, because of his talent, because of his gifts, he deceived many. And for John, the problem is not just that there are false prophets on the loose. Remember, Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, he's writing to seven churches in, in Asia, right? So he's concerned that the false prophet, prophets now have a platform in our churches. That's what he's concerned with. And many of us, we think false prophets are those who, like, miss prophetically. You know what I mean? I remember there was a prophet came through in my childhood. He told me, he prophesied I was going to be 6'8", right? <laughs> now, maybe he saw this other Nicholas Castle, my son, in his future, but I'm barely six foot, so he couldn't have been talking about me, right? Maybe he was talking about my son. I'm just going to hold on to that. He's going to be 6'8", amen? <laughs> you see, misses like that is usually what we say, hmm, that's a false prophet there. I ain't getting back at this prayer line. I'm not, I'm not following them on Instagram. None of that's a, that's a false prophet. But in the Bible, a false prophet was anyone who stood before people and proclaimed a message that was not true about God and a message that contradicts what has been written in Scripture. That's what a false prophet was in the Bible. And the problem with our mainstream preaching is that in an effort to appease the culture, in an effort to be accepted by the masses and hopes that the culture don't counsel us, we dilute the truth. Even when we're talking to our friends and hanging out, we dilute the truth in hopes that we aren't marked to be counseled by the culture. And we stand up here and we proclaim the truth of God and his word, but instead, that's what we're supposed to do, but instead, we're taking our preaching points from the culture. And many preachers and followers of Jesus Christ are taking their cues from the way things are instead of the way things ought to be. And I don't know about you, but I don't care how accepted wickedness may become in our government, in our schools, in our careers, in our music and media. I'm never going to applaud or celebrate or cheer on what God calls sin. All the real saints say amen. You couldn't pay me enough to come into agreement with what God calls sin. And I just wonder what our world would look like today if every disciple of Jesus decided to come out of agreement with sin. You see, it's one thing to sin, but it's another thing to wink at it and to wink at what God calls sin. You can't repent from something you refuse to name as sin. And the reason why we see so many Christians who look and live just like the world and have the same ideology as the world, the same theology as those who have no relationship with Jesus Christ, is because we've been taking our cues from the way things are in the world now, opposed to taking our cues from the way things ought to be as laid out in Scripture. It doesn't matter what your YouTube pastors say. The truth is, if you are a child of God, you take your cues on how to live your life, on how to conduct yourself from the word of God, not the culture. Then we see that the, and this says, this beast it talks about the next beast, um, the one who comes out of the, the earth, that he's going to be given this mark, the 666 mark, right? And the text says that 666, if you look at it closely, it's actually the beast's name. Now, the question everybody wants to know is, is this literal? Right? Is this mark of the beast a literal mark on a person's forehead, or is John speaking metaphorically? Well, once again, the clue lies in recognizing that the beast, as I've been saying, is mimicking Jesus Christ. Remember in Revelation 7, and several other chapters in Revelation, when John wrote that the seal of God is placed on the foreheads of his people. When we went through that chapter, did that mean that the name of Jesus would be marked and tatted on people's foreheads? No. So like we talked about then, when the Bible speaks of a name on someone's forehead, it's speaking about carrying the character of that name. The mark of Jesus Christ is the character of Jesus on us and in us. 
The mark of the beast is not a vaccine. I hate to, you know, break up all your predictions. Okay, the mark of the beast is not a vaccine. It's not a tattoo of 666 on a person's neck. Okay, on their arm, on their forehead. It's the character of the beast embedded under their skin. It is the character of the beast implanted in the soul. Revelation chapter 1, 3, 4, and 5, it refers to the Holy Spirit as the sevenfold spirit of God. Seven, as you all know, it is the number of, okay? The beast mimics the Holy Spirit, but he never measures up. And we see it again here. The number of six, here's the significance, it's just one lower than seven. So he is, that's the best he can do. That's the best he can measure up. He is perfectly incomplete when measured up to the completeness of God. That's all 666 means. And we have gotten it all wrong. The purpose of the number is not for us to spend our time trying to figure out who it is. Who the Antichrist is. Every presidential candidate, we say that's the, that's the Antichrist. Right? No, that's, that's not, our role is not to figure out who it is and who's going to be giving out the mark and what the mark going to look like. That's not our job. The purpose of the number in the text is to characterize for us who the beast is. When we talk about the mark of the beast, we are talking about internal character made manifest in behavior. It's not a future mass branding that's going to be tatted on us. That's not what it is. But here it is. You're not going to like this. The mark of the beast is when you decide not to take holiness serious. That's the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is when you decide to hold hands with sin. Somebody say amen. Amen. The mark of the beast, it's when you aren't serious about the kingdom of God. It's you not taking the Great Commission seriously. That's what the mark of the beast is. You are worried about a vaccine or a microchip or a tracker in your phone, but it's none of that. The mark, the characterization of the ways of the beast is when you don't follow the ways of the lamb. That is the mark of the beast. And so if you haven't gotten the memo just yet, this war that the enemy has declared on our lives, it is very real. And you can't fight him by jumping up, spinning around three times. You cannot fight him with a seasonal and a sporadic prayer life. No, no, no. You fight him by pursuing holiness. In order to fight the enemy, you must actively and consistently pursue holiness. What is holiness? It's to hate sin and to love righteousness. Holiness is loving God enough to hate sin, to even hate your secret sin. That's what holiness is. And historically, We have done a great job acknowledging public sin and a terrible job confessing private sin. Just because your room door is closed and it's dark and nobody's around, it doesn't make it any less of a sin. Just because nobody saw you pop the pill, come on somebody, it doesn't mean that it's not sin. Holiness is viewing all sin the way that God does. And learning to love righteousness. And I want you to know there's no such thing as small sins. There's only sins that are waiting to destroy everything you are serious about loving. That's it. The second thing we can do to fight in this battle against the kingdom of darkness is to get serious about prayer, worship, and fasting. I know this is elementary spiritually for most of you. But the truth of the matter is, most Christians don't have a consistent prayer life. Most Christians can go months and months, do go months and months without fasting. Too many Christians reserve their worship just for Sunday gatherings. Let's be real. But the book of Revelation calls our worship to the table and just asks us straight up, who are you going to worship? Are you going to worship the lamb, like I've been saying almost every week, or are you going to worship the beast? There's this cosmic battle between good and evil. There's this battle between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of darkness. And the question that lies on the table, whose side are you on? And I want you to know 
there's no such thing as indifference in this decision, right? To, to not choose a side is the way of the beast. There's many people standing in the gap saying that they're against the ways of the beast. But the truth is, if you're in the middle, if you're indecisive, if there's indifference, you, that is the way of the beast. That's his plan. So if obeying God is worship to God, who do you think you worship when you disobey him? I'm going to say this again. If obeying God is worship to him, that's what our Bible teaches us. Worship is our obedience to God. Who do you think you worship when you disobey him? You think you're just, I'm not worshiping nobody. I'm not worshiping nothing. No, no, no. When you choose to disobey God, you are actively participating in the plans of the kingdom of darkness. I know that's, that's what I'm saying. Right? Who do you think stands and receives the worship produced through your disobedience? If not God, who is it? There's no middle ground. Somebody shout, there's no middle ground. Which is why Jesus says, choose ye this day. Who are you going to serve? Like, make up your mind, who are you going to serve? That's also why Jesus said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. The middle, that lukewarm, what do he say? Spit you out. Pick a side. It's worse for you in the lukewarm. All right? When we get to chapter 14, we see three angels. The first angel in verse 6 says that this angel had the eternal gospel. I just love that part. He had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those living on earth, to every nation, to every tribe, language, and people. And this angel's gospel message was this. Fear God and give him glory. And worship the one who has made the heavens and the earth and the seas and the springs of water. Right? Now we know we have been commissioned, you hear this all the time, to go out into the world to share the gospel, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But this passage shows us that when we pursue obedience in this, we have divine help. Okay? If you want to experience the supernatural, if you want to experience divine help, open up your mouth and attempt to share the gospel. You see, the truth is, and this is why I love the book of Revelation, you have help that your eyes can't see. Don't complain about the wickedness in the world when every single day you live your life on complete mute when it comes to the only message that brings light. The kingdom of darkness is totally okay with you coming to church. Okay? He is okay with you coming to midweek. Right? He's okay with you serving in various capacities, but one thing that throws a wrench in all of his plans is when someone dares to open up their mouth to share about Christ. Amen. Satan isn't mad that you came to church, that you pressed your way to church today. He ain't mad about that. Because he knows most of us, we come to church to hear and to receive, but very rarely to receive in order so that we can share. There is no way a Christian should ever be bored. There is too much to do in the kingdom of God for a Christian to be bored. Too much. And the problem is, too many people only want to make an impact in the church, but don't want to make an impact where they live. Like, what about the impact in your community, in your neighborhood? We will fight over positions in the church and people will fight over a microphone, but your neighbors don't even know your name. You don't even pray with your own family. You don't even do Bible study with the people in your house, with your kids, with your significant other. But you want to lead a Bible study here? We got to really ask ourselves, for what? And this is the problem with Christianity in 2023. People want to feel important at church only, but have zero impact in their spheres of influence. You hear once a week. What about the people you see every day? And I want all of you who serve in, you know, different roles in ministry, whether you're holding a sign or serving on the media team, the praise team, whatever the case may be, I want you to hear me on this. It doesn't matter how many serve teams you sign up for. 
if you do not actively participate in the Great Commission, heralding the gospel of Jesus Christ, gospelizing your spheres of influence, all the things you love doing for Jesus and his church today will be the very things that would eventually burn you out. We were never, everybody say never. never. We were never wired to receive sermon after sermon, message after message, to leave this place and never share it with anybody. We wasn't wired that way. And you don't see it with your natural eyes, but the reason why you eventually get so tired of doing things you once loved to do for Jesus and his church is because when you sit down at the table Sunday after Sunday, midweek after midweek, and you partake of what's being served, but you never share, you are slowly but surely becoming spiritually obese. That's why you're so tired. We aren't exercising what we've been taught. We are hoarding the word when the word was given to us so that we can use it and, and impact our communities. We are called to be conduits when we receive this word, to be conduits of his word to other people. Amen. You show me a bored Christian, you show me a Christian who feels like they don't have any purpose or value or use in the kingdom of God, you're simply showing me a Christian who doesn't yet know and understand the gospel. Amen. 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 The second angel, I'm almost done, followed the first angel in verse 8 and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great which made all the nations drink the maddening of their adulteries. You see, the first century's readers of this text, they would have automatically known that John, when he speaks of Babylon, he's talking about Rome at that time. They are the new Babylon of the Old Testament. And the angel is shouting, fallen is Babylon, although at this time, Rome wouldn't be destroyed for another couple hundred years. So the text is showing us, again, that any nation that seeks to live apart from the living God simply cannot survive. It's the same for us. Destruction is bound to happen. It's guaranteed to happen because God is against those who live a life apart from him. The supreme threat to our world, to our country, to this city, it's not communism. It's not capitalism, socialism, racism, or any other ism. ism. But the supreme threat of them all is God coming to judge the world and each of us in his righteousness. That trumps all of that other stuff. Babylon has fallen, and this is good news, because the only way for people trapped within an ungodly system to hear the gospel is for the ungodly system to collapse. God never props up a kingdom or, or a system that is inconsistent with his kingdom. The third angel comes, and I should have a slide for this. Um, this is chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. It says, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast." And its image and receives the mark on their forehead or their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which have been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented. We don't like this. We, we really don't. It's bothersome to me as well. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke from their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest, day or night. And I love to sleep, y'all. There will be no rest. I don't get to because all the kids, but sorry. <laughs> there will be no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and its image. Or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Okay? So now when we hear this, it rubs us the wrong way. I've had many questions about this verse um, specifically. Right? It rubs us the wrong way to picture God so loving and gracious in this way, you know what I mean? Because we have been conditioned to think love should be absent of anger. We've been conditioned that the only love is only acceptance. It's only approval. But that's not the case. We think love should be absent of judgment and wrath. But that's not biblical, and to be honest, it's not even practical. The people you love the most have the capacity to stir the most wrath out of you. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> so it's not, that philosophy is not even practical. And here in our text, this angel is announcing 
what is called, and I want to present to you, the crisis of choice. And I know everybody's always talking about you only live once, but that's only true if you choose wrong. Our choices have eternal consequences. The decisions we make from day to day have eternal consequences. Hell is simply total separation from God. It's total separation. Throughout the entire Bible, God's wrath has always been something that men and women choose for themselves. Before hell is an experience inflicted by God, it is a state for which one opts into by retreating from the light which God shines to lead us to himself. I'm going to say this again because I really want you to hear me. Before hell is experienced or inflicted by God, it is a state for which one opts into by retreating from the light which God shines to lead us to himself. And I think I got this verse here. I'm going to end with this. Y'all know this, but y'all don't know the verses that come right after it. Let's look at John 3, 16. And I'm going to read John 3, 16 through 19. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Watch this. For God did not, did not, somebody say not, not. send his son into the world to condemn the world. So we can stop saying that. It says here that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned. What's that next word? Already. You're talking about wait for God to condemn you. No, you're standing in condemnation already if you choose not to believe today. It says because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And look at verse 19. This is the verdict. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. We see clearly from this text that Jesus did not come into the world again to condemn the world. It doesn't get any more clearer than that. But for those, and I want you to put this verse up, Whitney, if I have it, I'm not sure. Romans 1.28. For those who choose not to believe, God says, okay. He says, cool. Romans 128, look at this. Paul writes, for those who do not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved, some of your translations say a reprobated mind, so that people may do what ought not to be done. Those who say, I know how to handle And I know how to define sex better than God. God says, here you go. For those who says, I know how to define marriage better than God. He says, have your way at it. I know how to do this gender thing better than God. Here you go. I know how to do and define this Christian walk and lifestyle better than God does. Here. Have at it. God says, okay, you want to redefine how I'm calling you to live because of the pressures of this culture? Go for it. I know you don't believe it right now, but the most dangerous place for you to be ever is in your own hands. The most dangerous place for you to be is in your own hands. And all I'm trying to show you through these verses here, and I'm ending here. You can go ahead and start playing something soft. I'm trying to teach you nobody stands under the wrath of God besides those who have chosen to do so. God's judgment is to simply lead one to the implications of a decision they have already made. There's one writer who believes that when the time comes, I'm not talking about a biblical writer, commentator. um, He says when the time comes, people who are in the wrath of God, in this place called hell, they're still not going to have a desire to be with Jesus. So again, God's judgment is to simply lead one to the implications of of a decision they've already made. The essence of God's wrath is to give men and women what they choose in all its implications. Nothing more, nothing less. The wrath of God, it is a terrifyingly real thing. 
And one of the most disturbing, I keep thinking I'm about done, but I got one more verse here. <laughs> one of the most disturbing words that Jesus ever uttered, this feel like it does something to me still when I read it. Oh, maybe I don't have it. It's Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Okay. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Only the one who does the will. There's many people, we're going to say, Lord, there's many people who's always saying God, always saying Jesus, but no, no, no. That doesn't give you a ticket in. Verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we prophesy? Didn't we drive out demons into your name? Didn't we perform many miracles? Wasn't we showing up to church? Wasn't we in life groups and serving? Then I would tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. You see, many people have a proclamation of faith, but they have no possession of faith. I want us to move from just proclamation of faith to actually possessing the faith. And it doesn't matter how good of a person you think you are. It doesn't matter how good of a person you think they are. Those who have no possession of this ancient faith as laid out in this text, they have chosen the way of the beast. That's the reality. The wrath and judgment of God is a very real thing and it breaks my heart that we all know people who choose to live in light of God's judgment. It breaks my heart that there are people right now who have been choosing to live in light of God's judgment. But the good news of this gospel is that for those who put their faith in Jesus, he has already taken on God's wrath on the cross so we don't have to. And so the plagues, you're going to read about it later in chapter 15 and 16, the, the plagues you're going to see and the wrath you're going to see, you don't have to settle for none of that. That doesn't have to be your testimony. Jesus literally says, I didn't come into the world to condemn it, but to save it. And I love you all too much to just watch you settle for God's wrath when he's offering freely his love. For those of us who've been saved from the wrath of God, we praise God the way we do. That's why we worship God the way we do. That's why we shout the way we do. It's because we understand that we couldn't ever save ourselves. Ever. In fact, the Bible says our righteousness, it's nothing but filthy, nasty, dirty rags in the sight of God. So because of that statement alone, our salvation is never a product of what we put our hands to. It's not a product of how much Bible we re read. It's not a product of how much we praise. Our salvation is a product of our belief in what Jesus has already done. Thank you, Jesus. And I promise you, this is the last verse. Revelation, <laughs> Revelation 14, 20, okay? It says, they were trampled in the wine press outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses, bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadium. And so now I know this sounds weird. It's like, why are you ending the sermon on this verse? But I'm going to explain to you. John is saying that he saw a lot of blood, and it was as high as about four feet, and it stretched about 200 miles in distance. And all John is trying to say is that there is enough blood for you. That's all he's trying to say. There's people in here, you may be battling addictions, but he wants to remind you through this text, there's enough blood for you. You may be battling in your mind, but even with that, there's enough blood for you. You may be addicted to pornography, but there is enough blood for you. Everybody send it to your feet. Thank you, Jesus.